Welcome to another episode of the T to Green Golf Podcast. Really excited to bring this episode to all of you today. Whether you're a teenager, whether you're an adult, whether you're listening to your child who is an aspiring golfer, today's episode is what does it take to be a PGA card carrying member and head pro? Those questions, your curiosities, all are going to come together in this episode. We are privileged to have with us today Hunter Clay. Hunter is recently a graduate of an NAIA school. He was also promoted to head pro at Bridge Mill Athletic Club in Canton, Georgia. And so we will look forward to spending some time with Hunter, exploring his journey, and actually over the course of the conversation, we will have that question answered for you. So sit back, grab your son or daughter, grab your notepad if this episode of heels to you specifically, and let's enjoy the journey. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Hunter Clay to the Tita Green Golf Podcast. Welcome, Hunter. Thanks, Vic. I really appreciate being here. really appreciate the nice little gift you guys gave, too. Um, I'm just excited to be here today and answer some of y'all's questions. Well, it's our pleasure. We try to we try to show our gratitude to our guests, and this is just uh, you know one way to say thank you. We certainly know that being a head pro is all encompassing and your time is is your time and that of the members so we are grateful that you're here with us today absolutely let's <clears throat> let's move right in and, and let's give you an mm-hmm. opportunity to introduce yourself to the tea to green golf podcast community who is hunter clay yeah um that's a great question um first off i want to say uh hunter clay is a follower of christ um that's kind of how I direct my life and how I direct how I treat other people mm-hmm. and the areas around me and how I kind of attack my goals every day. Nice. Um, I'm the current head professional at Bridge Mill Athletic Club. Uh, I played collegiate golf for five years at Reinhardt University and I'm um, just kind of making my way through the professional golf world now, uh, working on my PGA schooling, and that's where I'm at right now in my life. Yeah, the one thing that I'd also like to add for those of you that are listening to this episode is extremely personable. Uh, Soft skills are as much an asset for Hunter as his ability to play. And for those of you that are curious about his ability to play, we, I encourage you to stay absolutely engaged to this episode because the last thing that I will ask him today is a extremely rare feat for any amateur, aspiring professional, early career professional, and seasoned member of the PGA, LPGA, DP World Tour, Senior LPGA Tour, etc. So stay tuned, and I'll help you understand how his soft skills marry finely to his uh, playing ability as a as a golfer. Hunter, I've known you, so in full transparency, mm-hmm. I've known you for about three or four years. Your dad and I are, are good buddies, and we play mm-hmm. golf periodically. Um, but but want to de- dive deeper into the story. Mm-hmm. How were you introduced to the game of golf, and how long have you been affiliated with the sport? So um, I've always been around the game uh, okay. growing up. My mom has uh, pictures of me from when I was two, like holding the finish. And nice. Then I played uh, – I played a little bit when I was younger. I'd go to the range with my dad. There used to be a range off uh, Highway 92 here in Georgia that we used to go to all the time. Okay. Um, so it really just the introduction of the game was connected through my dad. Um, he's somebody that I really look up to. And then uh, I've been affiliated with the sport full-time since I was 13. Uh, okay. I played some pretty high-level baseball, um, and I really enjoyed – my time playing baseball, but I was a late bloomer. Mm-hmm. Um, I graduated high school at five six, and I'm currently six foot now. Mm-hmm. So I really didn't have the body type to compete at the highest level that I wanted to in baseball, and so I decided to give golf a run because it's such an inviting game in the terms of you don't have to be – I mean, the way the game's trending now, you have to be in the gym every day. But at mm-hmm. the time and at that level, I could be small and still compete. Mm-hmm. 
and I just wanted a competitive space, and golf provided that for me. Um, I played around with my dad at a uh, Hilton Head National, okay. Hilton Head Island, okay. And uh, when I was thirteen, and I have not put a club down since. I think the longest break I've taken has been recently. I took a two week break of not touching a stick. <laughs> Bingo. Yeah, but um, just been attached to the game ever since at the hip. Well, I think there's a few things that come with Hunter's answer there. And you all know that have listened to the episodes long enough that I like to put a paper clip every so often on an answer to one of our guests. And I think this is another one of those moments. It, you know, Hunter is not a single sport athlete. And I know there's plenty of debate in the environment today for kids that are coming up, whether they should be single sport athletes or whether they should play multiple sports. And and I know that for me, I was a multi-sport athlete who ultimately gravitated to golf as an adult. And we hear that right now from, from a head pro, a member of the PGA, who started his athletic journey as a baseball player and then was able to take that basic, fundamental athletic agility and found the love for the game of golf. And, and here we are today, and, and he's excelled in, in many ways and maybe some ways even beyond that. So uh, I think the other piece is that it doesn't matter where you are. He clearly has grown five, six inches since, uh, since, since the point of his answer, and, and he's grown into his body. And so it's a moment of encouragement to those kids who are sitting next to their mom and dad and – and feeling less than because they're shorter than the average of their peers. So, again, another paper clip piece that you can um, refer to in the episode and and uh, and continue to inspire your own children. When you think about that time, Hunter, mm-hmm. baseball, right, golf, mm-hmm. baseball at some point beyond two, right, had stepped ahead of golf. Mm-hmm. At that point. Yeah. Yeah. When you get to that 12, 13, mm-hmm. what was the inspiration to say golf is going to be what I invest in at this point going forward? Right. That's a great question. Uh, I'm a very competitive person. And uh, I had actually played a little bit of tennis between okay. picking up the sticks. <laughs> okay. So um, golf was really the one that I felt gave me the best chance to compete Mm -hmm. at a high level. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was just, I just naturally had a pull towards it. Um, the greatest thing about golf is that you're competing against yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not one-on-one going against someone. I mean, you are once you get to the tournament stage, but the, I fell in love with the grind of competing against myself every day. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really what inspired me to stay with the game. Can, can you dive into that mm-hmm. a little further? Um, and, and I think the reason it's important is you took a moment in time within yourself at a very early age to understand um, authentically who you were as a competitor. Mm-hmm. You had the option to play a team sport. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had the option to play tennis. Mm-hmm. How did you... How did you marry your competitive drive and desire to to compete and align it with golf and say, this is the one of the three? And I think that's Mm -hmm. an important question to help the T Degree in Golf podcast community understand whether Mm -hmm. they're going through it themselves or whether this is another way to have a conversation with their child. Yeah. For me personally, uh, it set benchmarks. Ooh, nice. Different than uh, other sports did. So in golf, there's always quantified numbers. Like yeah. we talk about, we're looking at guys on tour today and guys on other tours, and they're all about numbers. Like, mm-hmm. am I hitting my driving distance? Am I finishing in the top percentage of putting? Mm-hmm. And for me, at a young age, it was just breaking numbers, nice. breaking 100, breaking 90, breaking 80, breaking 70, and just grinding down through that I felt that I was progressing on a ladder and at the golf I started progressing pretty quickly Mm -hmm. and I loved the fact that it was so different 
every day. Like, yep. you go out one day, and it's 80 degrees and sunny, and then the next day, it could be 65 and raining, mm-hmm. but you're still trying to hit the same benchmarks. Right. And there's a lot of variety in the game. There's plenty of different courses you can go to, and that's kind of the part I fell in love with. I felt that golf let me be creative in my shot-making ability. Right. So um, when I first started, my dad uh, didn't let me have any wedges. I just had nine iron to driver. And he said, get creative around the green. Figure out a way to get up and down. If you're in the bunker, figure out a way to open the face on that nine iron and splash it out. Yeah. So that's what I started with. And uh, I found putting to be a little bit boring at first. Because sure. I was like, I can't I can't swing as hard as I can. I can't <laughs> right. smack it. Right. But um, I learned quickly to fall in love with the putter because the putter is how, how those numbers get hit. Absolutely. So. You know, I think that's a really, really good answer. I think built into that is a level of self-esteem and self-assurance as a young kid. And I think the other piece of that dives into a child's creative mindset. You know, you get these professional psychologists and theorists uh, that talk about as as they, they encourage you as an adult, you should always tap back in to that creative childlike. To, to be creative as an adult mm-hmm. and you tapped into that very early on and that mm-hmm. was a driver. So again, I think that's a wonderful answer right. for the TD green golf podcast community. So we, we, we find the inspiration. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes you through junior golf, mm-hmm. takes you into high school. I suspect somewhere between sophomore and senior year, which for most athletes is when attention is starting to build up. Um, you end up at Reinhardt mm-hmm. College Golf, and this is this is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, in the spirit of growing the game, mm-hmm. the the idea, um, maybe subconscious, less than conscious, is that mm-hmm. in doing so, opportunities are more bound than they ever were 15, 20, 25 years right. ago. With that being said, mm-hmm. the The NAIA route is a lesser known route than D1, D2, D3 under this NCAA banner. Mm -hmm. Your route was that of a lesser known, but Mm -hmm. where opportunities still exist. Mm -hmm. NAIA, can you share your experience getting recruited and then your years as a college golfer? Yeah, uh, we could could talk about my college golf career for a while, for (laughs) sure. Uh, Lots of ups and downs in there. But, um, yeah, the recruitment process was pretty simple um, okay. for me just because I was not a highly coveted athlete coming mm-hmm. out of high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a scoring average of about 77. Okay. Um, nice. Which, if you're trying to get recruited and you're trying to go D1, D2, that's really not going to cut it. Okay. Like, you're you're probably not going to get a lot of looks for coaches. You might find some walk-on spots if you're – if your grades were really good, mm-hmm. but, uh, at that 77 average, it's, it's pretty tough to get offers. Okay. And, uh, I had two offers, um, coming out of a high school. I had an offer to play immediately and be one of the top mm. players at Georgia military college mm-hmm. down in Milledgeville. Okay. Um, it's a junior college. It's a two year opportunity, but they've had some pretty good players come through. Okay. And then the other option was Reinhardt University, Mm -hmm. which is in my own county, and I hadn't heard of it um, until I was looking at spots to try to get a roster spot. I was looking at spots where I thought I could go play. I thought I could impact the team. And uh, Reinhardt University is one. So I reached out to the coach. His name is uh, Dan Mullins. Nice. Um, Definitely look into him if you haven't. Uh, Unbelievable uh, PGA professional had some involvement with uh, developing the AJGA tour. Reinhardt University, folks. Reinhardt University mm-hmm. in Georgia. Yeah. So Dan Mullins um, was gracious enough to give me an opportunity, and he went and watched me play. And he said, "Look, Hunter, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, you're five six. You're a hundred pounds. You're probably not going to play your freshman year." But we do have some spare money lying around that we can offer you. And I really want you to take a year at Reinhardt and get better and see how we can do it. And me, personally, at the time, I didn't realize how gracious Dan was being to me. Mm -hmm. But um, that kind of lit a fire under my behind. Nice. Um, 
I'm the type of person that if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to show Mm -hmm. you that I can. Mm -hmm. And so my freshman year, I ended up starting nine out of 10 tournaments. And at uh, five, six, mm -hmm. nice. And my scoring average stayed the same, but I got a lot of really good experience because at age 18, you're jumping in playing, you could be playing 22, 23, 24 year old guys immediately off the bat. And uh, I actually had a teammate that was 25. So immediately off the bat, I was right there exposed to playing against grown men. Yep. You go from 18 and under to grown men immediately. Right, right, right. So that's quite the <laughs> that's quite the jump to take, and it's quite the learning curve. But um, that's kind of how I jumped into my college golf experience. Um, I stayed at Reinhardt for all five years. Uh, we had a coaching change during COVID. It was kind of a unique time to be a college golfer. Okay. Um, and we got a new coach who was a former player of ours, Evans Nichols. And uh, Evans Nichols and I gelled really well. We had a lot of the same goals in terms of what we wanted the program to look like, and we worked together on that. And I was mm. really appreciative of his time at Reinhardt and his accomplishments, so it drove me to be – an even better player. And uh, my junior year, we got an invite to the national title. And okay. uh, our team, we are kind of one of those cusp teams to okay. where in the NAI, there's about 30 teams that get invited, about 17 make the cut. Okay. And we're, we were one of those cusp teams. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, we missed the cut. Okay. But if you finish in the top 40, after two days, you get to remain as an individual in the tournament. And so I was sitting right around 15 or 18 after after the two days. So I was That's able to continue day. and play those next two days, yeah. and I ended up finishing fifth. Congratulations. That's huge. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so this is, um, first of all, shout out to Coach Dan Mullins and Coach mm-hmm. Evans Nichols, uh, mm-hmm. both at Reinhardt that had – Amazing impact. Um, one mm-hmm. aspect of Hunter's answer that I really like and and encourage um, everyone to dial into is the collaboration between coach and player. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know factually if that mm-hmm. doesn't exist at your more renowned D1 golf mm-hmm. programs, but for the right student athlete, college student, that collaboration, that back and forth, and being able to establish your voice so young in your life, um, that can have resonating impact well beyond the college experience. And so I don't think we lose sight of that. And again, shout out to Coach Evans Nichols for creating that environment uh, for Hunter. I think the other thing that we're talking about here, we're really learning from Hunter, is that uh, freshman year, lit a fire under him two, two and a half, three years later. Um, he becomes top five nationally at the end of his junior year. So we're going to dive into the last year, year and a half of his college experience. And I think that's worth celebrating as well. So junior year yeah. ends, mm-hmm. you all, you, you get a taste mm-hmm. of, as a team, you get a taste mm-hmm. of what it's like to be a national champion. Mm-hmm. You more specifically, figure out that I am far more advanced than this five, six kid who was really looking for an opportunity. I'm one of the nation's best. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what happens after that as a college golfer. So in my personal... And Mm -hmm. and in doing that, Mm -hmm. what changed in your routine... um, you know, essentially, what did you learn yeah. after the junior year? What didn't you like? What was what was that prep leading to that senior year like? And then definitely, what yeah. was the outcome? Yeah, absolutely. So after my junior year, um, it really changed my perspective of, mm. okay, I am one of those guys that can win this national title tournament. Right. And uh, it just pushed me even more. So my senior year, going into my senior year, I finished as an All-American my junior year. And, uh, that's nice. Yeah. That's, that's really where it was like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I might have nice. a little something here. And <laughs> yes. I had a talk, long talks with my dad and we looked at, uh, I had, uh, some potential spots to go to a different school and maybe transfer 
maybe another opportunity, but I talked with my family and my loved ones, and I decided to stay at Reinhardt University. Mm -hmm. And going into my senior year, um, I was able to capture my first win at Callaway Gardens at the Skyhawk Invitational. And uh, I had a really good battle with uh, this golfer named John Houck. Make sure to look out for him. He's at uh, University of Tennessee Chattanooga right now. Okay. He's he's an extremely good player. Okay. And uh, make sure to keep an eye out for him. He was number one in NAI when he was in the NAI. But he's playing D1 now. And uh, make sure to keep your eye out for John Houck. That is the name you're going to want to remember. Um, so I was able to beat him in a playoff and that experience really solidified my confidence. And so we roll into conference as a team and we're able to capture our first conference title since 2016. We won the 2022 AAC, uh, conference mm-hmm. and I was a co-champion with John Howe. Mm-hmm. So it was my second collegiate win. And, uh, I was really rolling, playing some good golf, excited about the future. Mm-hmm. And we roll into nationals um, at TBC Deer Run, and we make the cut for the first time ever as a program. Nice. So we made the cut. Um, that was really our main goal with Evans and I. What we were talking about was to make the cut and finish top 10. I don't believe we finished top 10, but okay. we did We did make the cut for the first time in school history as yeah. a team. And I ended up finishing 10th that year. Okay. And uh, another good showing. Improved my score a little bit. And... Uh, it was a really fun experience my senior year. Um, so rolling into my fifth year that summer, um, I played in a little bit of section events, and I was able to win my first pro tournament. Nice. Um, 2022 Milton Martin Honda Classic. Okay. It's uh, hosted at Chattahoochee every year. And that really solidified for me is, okay, I might have a little bit of something here. Absolutely. I might have a little bit of initiative to go play a little bit professionally and try to make some money. Um yep actually playing the game, yep. doing what I love. Yep. And so uh, I rolled into my fifth year, didn't win, finished second a couple times, but I got some really good playing experience, and I got to know myself when I saw more adversity. Mm. I got to see how I responded to that. And so that ended my college career, and I've been doing a little bit of assistant coaching this past fall mm. as a contract guy. Good. But um, really excited to – continue working with Reinhardt when I can and yeah. uh I really enjoy being around that college golf environment it's very competitive so a ton of substance yeah a lot to, yeah, to, I try to talk quickly but, no no yeah. no I, I you know again I think these episodes are informative for more than just one reason and <laughs> I am truly hopeful that you know as we explore what does it take to be a head professional and a member mm-hmm. of the PGA Tour, then at this point in the episode, I am hopeful mm-hmm. and trusting that you have gathered a ton of nuggets, yeah. uh, certainly from Hunter's career through Reinhardt, um, the effort that he puts in, the commitment that he puts in, the fact that he won, <laughs> but he lost, and he lost more than he won, but he mm-hmm. still learned from the losses. He talked about adversity. Um, All of this builds the character of an athlete, particularly those who win and like to win. Um, But it also prepares you for life as well, which is the journey that he is on right now. I think the other thing that I want to do is really take a moment to give a shout out to his mother and his father. Um, Really solid people. I know his father uh, more than I know his mother, but his dad is involved um, as as a father, as a coach. Um, and so shout out to, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Clay on this episode as well. And, and again, just want to show how parents do have a profound impact in the life of their children and their children's goals. So what we have today is a role model, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And take a moment, your, whether it's at Bridge Mill or Reinhardt, mm-hmm or doing something on behalf of the PGA, or something, all of the above, right? You're sitting in front of 150 kids from all walks of life. What advice would you share for those wanting to develop and pursue a college golf career? Um, if you want to play college golf, and you're really serious about it, it takes a lot of commitment. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I spent in high school every day that I could practicing, and I was grateful that I had a lot of opportunities to practice, to play, to get better. Um, if you want to play college golf, continue to play the game. Build your player resume and send it to as many coaches as possible. Mm-hmm. You never know where an opportunity will open up or what doors will open up. So make sure you get set up. Email coaches professionally. Ask for meetings. Ask for phone meetings. Mm-hmm. Ask for campus tours. Um if coaches like your player resume and they meet you in person, they like you, they will most likely give you an offer. And I think it doesn't hurt to have a video too. And so, no. you know, full transparency, there is a YouTube video mm-hmm. of a much younger Hunter Clay. Yes, there is. There <laughs> out, is. On the, out on the internet. I've got a, I've got a mini fro in that video. Some, uh, some, I believe it's Michael Jackson playing in the background. <laughs> But uh, there's a video of me uh, with a much underdeveloped swing. But, um, yeah, it's out there. And I did cre- not tell him I had gotten access to <laughs> yeah. that. But he, he, along with everybody else, knows that right now. So That's awesome. A video doesn't hurt yeah. either. You know, you, you've talked to us about some of your achievements, um, notably – Top five, top ten, second place. Mm-hmm. But but when you think about the evolution mm-hmm. of getting to the point and getting better, mm-hmm. what are some of those less popular achievements that you hung your commitment on when you were going through that grind? And earlier yeah. you talked about being able to benchmark I'm mm-hmm. no longer shooting 100. I'm shooting 95 right now. Mm-hmm. So are there are there other benchmarks that you can just offer the Tita Green Golf Podcast community mm-hmm. um, to measure their evolution and their growth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, journaling and logging practice was a huge part of where I was in college. Um, mm. So it's not necessarily the benchmarks that you hit on the course of shooting numbers, but the process of getting better every day, that would be one that I would share with the Tita Green podcast community. Um, By journaling and benchmarking your practice, uh, it gives you a sense of accomplishment, even if you're not hitting your numbers on your course or you're not exactly where you want to be in terms of how competitive you are in tournaments. Um, I sat down with my coach, Denise Colleen, when we were younger, and we sat down and we set out a practice plan and what I should be working on. So I took measurements from my tournament rounds of how many greens I hit, putts, all that good stuff, and I was able to center my practice around what I had done on the course, and I could really focus on areas that I needed to get better. So um, I would say benchmarking your practice – getting with your coach, getting a practice plan together. Um, Those are little benchmarks that you can hit that aren't necessarily as popular. Um, In college, it was uh, staying routinely in the gym. Um, It was nice to have teammates on campus to help keep you accountable in that aspect. But um, now as a professional, I have to keep myself accountable. Yes. So um, college really prepared me to stay, um, keeping my body right, eating the right way, and, be in condition to go win tournaments. Yeah, and, and, and again, for, for the T to Green Golf Podcast community, um, including the children and aspiring professional golfers that we have on here, I hope that you all can connect to the process as, as, uh, as a byproduct or partner to benchmarks. And for those of you that are playing and have played other sports, I think there's ability to relate Hunter's answer to that. Uh, I know that as a former basketball player, when I was in high school, there were days where I would lay on my back and just focus on form and extension of the basketball towards the goal. And I I learned that from Kyle Macy at the University of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And so I would do that. And and I saw the byproduct of that. So uh, commitment, routine, benchmarking, um, really, really good prescriptions to take to improve your game. And again, shout out to Denise Colleen, um, 
Hunter's coach. Mm -hmm. Uh, Denise is also a a former member of the LPGA and current member of the Legends of the LPGA, which is the official Senior Ladies Professional Golf Association Tour. Mm -hmm. Head pro, Mm -hmm. PGA member, car carrier. Mm -hmm. How does it feel? Um, it, it feels incredible. Um, I didn't, when I stepped foot on Reinhardt's campus, I didn't know where it would lead me, yeah. but, um, I was able to get an opportunity, uh, to work as a head professional under Troy Thompson Yep. and shout uh, out to Troy. Yeah. We love Troy, <laughs> um, under Troy Thompson and being a head pro at such a young age has definitely been a challenge, um, mm-hmm. working to get respect at mm-hmm. my age. Mm-hmm. Um, luckily, we have a really good member base at Bridge Mill. Correct. And I'm able to connect with a lot of, of really cool people. Um, uh, holding my PGA associate card right now, um, it feels awesome. I'm excited to start uh, my level one education and uh, challenge myself in terms of what it takes to be a professional in the industry of working at different courses. Yep. And uh, I think getting my PGA education will help open up some new doors for me personally. Mm-hmm. And uh, it'll help further my accreditation as mm-hmm. a professional. So going through that PGA program, um, it's vital uh, to be in the golf industry. And can you just expand on that just a mm-hmm. little bit? So the process of becoming a PGA Tour member, is that a right. combination of playing ability and education? Um, if you wanted to play on the PGA Tour, it's pretty much strictly playing ability. Okay. And uh, gathering sponsors who believe in you. Right. And who trust in your ability to go get it done at Q School. Right. Um, being a PGA member... Uh, the PGA of America, it requires uh, being employed full time yep. at a golf course and then going through your PGA education. Um, it's basically mini college for people who want to work in the golf industry. They have a professional route and a teaching route mm-hmm. that you can take. And so if you're going to be working in the golf industry, it takes a little bit of both, to be honest. Yeah. And I think the other thing that it's important to note is early on, uh, and my guess is that it could vary from course to course, but Hunter has been affiliated with Bridge Mill for much longer than his recently becoming head pro. Yeah. And so being able to build that relationship, he mentioned Troy Thompson, who mm-hmm. he continues to work under, but worked alongside and and, and, and Troy kind of mentored him and tutored him to where he is today. Um, that relationship is vital. So just another nugget for those of you that want to follow the footsteps that Hunter has walked is pursue an opportunity to find a job, an opportunity to roll at a local course um, near you. Mm-hmm. As a head pro... Um, I imagine you're finding your space, Mm -hmm. if you haven't already, in golf's Growing the Game initiative. It Mm -hmm. is a very big, inclusive, diverse, we're going to sustain this sport for years going forward initiative. Mm -hmm. Um, What are your thoughts? And in the present and future, how do you see yourself positively impacting the game? Yeah, um, I feel like personally – um, as a professional in the golf industry, it's almost your responsibility to help nice. grow the game. Nice. Um, you want to be interacting with members. You want to be inviting mm. to people to the game. Mm-hmm. And uh, one way that we're doing that up at Bridge Mill is our partnership with Georgia Golf Performance. Yep. Um, they give all of our lessons. Uh, they host a facility in our bay on the left-hand side of the range. And uh, I got to work a little bit with uh, Bill Murchison, who's a Class A PGA this summer, and working with him in his junior camps. Um, He invited me as a guest speaker for one day, and he also had me play with uh, the juniors for a couple days. And growing that connection with the juniors um, at your course is very vital. Um, I'm always sneaking out to the green, talking to the juniors, seeing how they're doing 
asking them what tournaments they got coming up and trying to keep them involved at the course. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel like the course is a great space to grow as a person mm-hmm. um, when you're a junior golfer. And uh, you're for the most part, you're staying out of trouble on the golf course. So that helps too. But um, yeah, I just remember people coming up to me when I was a junior and staying involved in my life. Yep. And I kind of want to continue that trend. And that's one way that I've personally helped to grow the game. Uh, another way we're doing it at Bridge Mill is uh, our Ladies Golf Association. Yep. Um, it's grown at quite a rapid pace. I believe there's around 40 members right now. And uh, we hosted our first ladies member guest this year nice. at the club. So uh, those are ways that we're trying to impact the game, um, not just through men's golf, but through junior and women's yep. as well. Yeah, and I would say just from what I've been able to see, you're going to do a phenomenal job. I know the baseline or the foundation of the work at Bridge Mill is very diverse Mm -hmm. and it's very inclusive. And so I don't imagine that you won't continue to have success on growing that going forward. Mm -hmm. To the TD Green Golf Podcast community, one of the things that I mentioned early on is that I would highlight Mm -hmm. Hunter's technical skills and more specifically his ability to play the golf, his, his proficiency as a golfer to his soft skills. And, and I do believe his soft skills are an asset to his role as head pro and his ability to get along with the membership. And I've seen them personally at play. So what we're going to do right now is elevate his playing proficiency as a golfer, um, I know him at Hunter. I playfully will call him right now as Mr. 59. <laughs> and so I'm going to let that sink in for about five, 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, some of you all may slip back on the couch or on your seat, or you <laughs> may move closer to the edge of it. Yes. This young man, uh, about a month or so ago, Admittedly, it was probably two weeks after he and I played together. Yep. He shot 59. Yes. What is, nope, Bridge Mill is not a par 60 course. It is a par 72 course. Mm-hmm. And he shot 59. Mm-hmm. Take us through that experience, um, including what you did on 17. That was, uh, that was quite the experience for sure. Uh, first off, I want to thank... Uh, my Callaway rep, Mason Kirk, for helping getting me fitted with the right equipment um, over at Callaway Golf. Uh, I'm very grateful to be a Callaway staffer and be a part of the team and what they've got going on and what they've got coming out next year. Um, but with that being said, um, I put a new putter in the bag a couple weeks before. Uh, you guys are probably very familiar with it. It's the Odyssey Jailbird 380, uh, seen from the likes of Ricky Fowler and Wyndham Clark. And uh, that was kind of a little bit of confidence booster for me. I didn't think it'd be, I don't think it'd be 59. So (laughs) right, the flat stick does it again. Yeah, it did it again. Um, So I was just sitting on my couch Friday night and I get a call from my boss, Troy Thompson. And he said, Hey, I know you're off tomorrow, but uh, there's a spot open in the MGA. And they asked if you or me would play. I can't do it. I got too much stuff going on. Would you like to play? And I was like, ah, it's going to be cold in the morning. Like, I'm not sure I want to wake up that early. But I was like, <laughs> sure, why not? Like, I'll, I'll go play. And so uh, went out with some of the guys from the MGA and uh, got to connect with the members a little bit. It's one of mm-hmm. my favorite parts of my job, for yep. sure. And uh, ended up making like a 20-footer for birdie on the first and then part hole two. And I was like, ah, it's going to be a normal day. And then I uh, birdied three, eagled four, and I was like, and I stuck it to two feet on five. I was like, okay, I might have a little something wrong. <laughs> right, you think? <laughs> and then I ended up missing the green on six and missed the green on seven. I was like, oh, well, there goes that. And I chipped in on seven, and I was like, okay. <laughs> and all of a sudden make, make another couple birdies and 29 on the front. I'd never broken 30 before, and uh, 31 was my previous low. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like, right. just – Broke another benchmark. Right. Let's just keep it rolling into the back. 29, folks. 29 yeah. on the outward nine. Yeah, and I was like, okay, well, we'll just keep it rolling. And I kind of blacked out for a little bit, made a lot more birdies. and then, The zone, yep, the uh, zone. Birdied 16, and 
all of a sudden I Uh-oh. was I was uh, 12 under with two holes to play. Only needed one birdie, and I had a par five left and a pretty gettable par four. So hit a perfect drive on 17, uh, had 100 yards in to a pin that was just on top of a slope, and I uh, decided to hit the 60 degree and nipped it perfect and ripped it off the slope and uh, had 50 feet for birdie. There it is. Ended up uh, throwing a little three putt in there. Yes. So yes. three putted 17. All of a sudden, I'm 11 under. And I'm very upset because how many opportunities are you going to get to break 60? That's right, right, right. So, and, I, and, and that hole is gettable for you. Er, 17 yeah, 17's is absolutely. Every time. Um, I got to talk to Larry Mize at the Masters. He said it was his favorite hole on the course because, okay. because of how different it can play each yes, time. Yes, yes. Um, so I get to 18. It's a par 5. Uh, I rip driver down the right side. I'm a little bit frustrated. But uh, I get an eight iron in my hand out of the rough and uh, hit a cut up and over a tree, went to eight feet, and fortunately made the putt, broke 60, shot 59. And I uh, felt like a, a little celebrity at the, at the course for a little bit. You but still are. Yeah, I'm just, I was just uh, really grateful that uh, I decided to wake up that day and go to the course and grateful that God gave me the opportunity to go do what I love. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again... You know, as I said earlier, that is a rare feat. There's there's far more people that have shot 60 than there are people that have shot 59. And as good as 60 is, mm-hmm. the gap between 60 and 59 is significantly wider. Yeah, I, right? was, I was shaking on that eight-footer for sure. I was, I was nervous. Well, again, congratulations. We know the Thank scorecard you. is in the clubhouse. Mm-hmm. And so um, wanted to make sure that we shared that awesome moment. Yeah. So we've come to the end of our conversation and it's been a good one. And again, this is really about what does it take to become a head pro, a member of the PGA? When you think about the work that you're doing today, um, your journey, whatever Mm -hmm. that may be, um, how you support us at Bridge Mill, Mm -hmm. how can the T to Green Golf podcast community help support you going forward? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, I started a golf Instagram not too long ago uh, called Hunter Clay Golf, and uh, I'll be posting a lot of content on there coming up. I got a trip planned down to the PGA show, going to film a little bit of content uh, down at Hammock Dunes Golf Course, and then um, flying to Phoenix in February, going to film a little bit of content there. And so um, just supporting the page, just give it a follow, watch some of the videos. Um, I'm trying to create some content that people will enjoy. Yep. Um, I enjoy posting it, and if people enjoy consuming it, then that's that's great. Um, another way T to Green Golf uh, community can support me is just keep up with the tournaments. I'll be playing a lot of section events this year, and um, the plan hopefully by 2025 is to get my playing ability consistent enough to maybe play a little bit on the APGA Tour. Nice. So uh, just – Keep following what I'm doing, support um, in any way that you feel necessary, and uh, I will continue to keep honoring God and furthering my career as a professional. That will definitely take you far. So want to uh, thank Hunter. We also want to give a shout-out to Even Par Golf, uh, mm-hmm. Even Par as well. And we hope that you enjoyed this episode. Certainly a lot of nuggets for you in growing your own game or you being a supporter of a niece, nephew, or your own children growing their game. We're thankful for head pro at Bridge Mill Athletic Club, Hunter Clay. We wish him continued success. The door and the microphone is always open to you. So we'll hope that you'll come back and share with us at some point in the future to talk about your success. As we always say to the community, hit it straight from T to green. We are out.